Okay, I think we're recording. Everyone see that red dot in the corner? Yep. Okay, we're good. All right, I'd like to call to order our study session for November 10th, 2020. Um, the item tonight will be a discussion of our council goal on equity, justice, and inclusion, which will be led by our wonderful city manager and wonderful uh, police chief. Well, and technically, I'm going to make our new equity program manager get involved in this discussion as well. So, <laughs> just um, before nothing we... like throwing him into the deep end of the pool, huh? I did write the staff report <laughs> and I did write the PowerPoint, but he has seen the PowerPoint and we have a meeting on this just to make sure that um, we're hitting all the right notes. Um, but before we get into the presentation tonight, I, I do think it would be a miss if I didn't talk very briefly about the fact that the that Clackamas County is moving into a pause tomorrow for COVID. Um, so for any public that's watching this tonight, please know that up until the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we are in pause, which means we're asking people to minimize how many interactions they're having socially. If it's all possible, work from home. Uh, try not to um, have any more interactions than you really need to right now. This is in hopes of trying to slow things down going towards our hospital system. Uh, we're, we're getting nervous. We have been doing better than most of the country right now on this, but we are catching up. So please uh, spend the next two weeks spending some quality time with the people closest to you, but otherwise avoid interactions outside of the home. Um, moving into equity for tonight. Um, about a month ago, month and a half ago, council had a discussion about your new goal. We also received a bunch of information about our stops data, our police department, how we interact around use of force. And during that conversation, one of the topics was discussing the council resolution and making sure that we had captured all the things that you wanted to capture based on the listening sessions that we had participated in. Unfortunately, we didn't have the notes from one of the three listening sessions at that time. And so you all asked me to come back uh, when we were able to have that broader conversation. So this uh, discussion tonight is at that request. And uh, the reason that we decided to do this as a study session tonight is because it became somewhat disjointed during our last meeting to have a consistent discussion just because we had so many topics. Um, so I wanted a study session where this really was our only discussion for the night and nobody felt rushed. That does not mean it has to take a huge amount of time. It can take as little or as much time as council is interested in taking. Um, but I just wanted it to be dedicated time. So we also if anybody does jump into um, the meeting as a, a participant or watching the meeting through the Zoom channel, we are going to be bringing and inviting anyone to make comments throughout this conversation. So if we end up with community members who are interested, Scott, and you see those come through um, on the participant list, please just call, you know, somehow let me know, drop me a line, um, and we'll call them in to make a public comment at that time. Uh, this is expected to be more back and forth than normal, and that's what study sessions are. So if that works for everyone, I'm going to pull up the, okay, I'll pull up the. Hey, Anne, could, um, could we, could you introduce John and let him in? You know? It's in my PowerPoint. Oh. Okay. Ruining everything. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, if uh, my PowerPoint will come up, that would be helpful. Hold on one second. Um, yes, we are, uh, John is a part of tonight's meeting, so he is actually going to be introduced in the PowerPoint. Hold on one second, and I'll try and get this to work. There it is. Okay. And, uh, view. Okay. Uh, so this is our equity, inclusion, and justice update. Uh, Council set its goal back in August, and this is an opportunity for you all to talk about the goal, see if there are any things that we missed, as well as receive a general update from the city about what we've been working on for the last few months. Um, I've broken this into three phases, and when I say I, I mean Kelly Brooks, uh, because Kelly Brooks actually was the person who helped me structure this out. And the way to think about this is phase one is what happened until I wrote the staff report. It's really the work behind us largely. 
from today all the way through April, that's phase two, that's John's early time here. And it's really gonna be focused largely on policing because of the calls from our community to focus on policing. It also helps us align with the union negotiations we're gonna be doing this, this spring. So that's why we're focusing so much on policing in that second phase. But the real reason is to buy John some time to meet with people, to meet with community members, to meet with all of you, to talk to staff, get to know staff before we um, try and solidify an equity plan and, and really make sure we do this right. So I'm trying to give him three to six months just to meet people before he's over committing on where we're going. So to begin with. This is John. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to him to do some introductions of himself and you all are invited to ask him any questions. Thank you, Anne, and um, good evening. Um, Mayor Gamba, um, Council President Faulkner, uh, Councilor Parks, Councilor Beatty, it's good to see you again, um, and Councilor Heisey. Um, so uh, just to introduce myself, um, Again, my name is John Hennington. I am grateful and honored to be entrusted to um, take on the equity program for the city of Milwaukee. Um, I am sorry I can't be with you this evening in Milwaukee. I'm still here in Salt Lake City, um, but I certainly am looking forward to being there at the start of December and getting to work um, on, this, um, on this wonderful program that you've um, made a priority. Um, so a bit about my background. Um, I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, so a city that's uh, long known um, for its history in the civil rights movement. Um, growing up there um, uh, as a young black man, I certainly um, saw and felt the echoes of that period of time. Um, though I, I was still fortunate. Um, I still was able to um, experience um, the privileges that I had with me growing up in a middle-class family, um, growing up in, a, in an area that had not been marginalized as much as other parts of our community. So um, I had it fortunate and I was um, really unaware um, of some of the really deep issues of systematic racism that existed in our community. Um, I would learn as I grew up uh, about those um, firsthand. Um, and as I began working government, um, that followed me. Um, I worked at Salt Lake County. Um, I moved to Utah, began working at Salt Lake County as the citizen advocate um, and later their associate public information officer. And uh, in those roles, um, I worked very closely with members of the community, various populations, and um, I saw firsthand um, how good governance um, you know, governmental policies can benefit communities, um, can provide opportunities. I also saw working with some cities the opposite, um, how uh, careless policies, policies built on um, old ideas and um, with a um, focus towards certain populations and not others um, could harm uh, marginalized communities um, and keep them in that marginalized state. So um, doing that work, um, I found a, that it was important to um, look through that lens, um, to keep an eye on um, you know, the policies I was advocating as a member of the mayor's cabinet. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think that there was a lot of work that we could have done, um, that this was not the issue of the day. And um, unfortunately, I wish that we had done more at the time to address these issues. So I applaud you as a city for taking this on and, and leading out uh, on this important topic. Um, after working for Salt Lake County, I moved to the city and county of Honolulu, um, and there um, was an advisor to the uh, Parks and Recreation Department. Um, and in doing that work, um, again, I saw how um, this issue of diversity, equity, and conclusion could be applied to local governance. Um, there, there's a park. Um, if you've ever been to Honolulu, there's a beautiful park called Thomas Square. Um, it is shaped like a Union Jack. And um, that is for a very specific reason. It is in that park, in that location, um, that the British government um, restored the empire of King Kamehameha III, um, re restoring a Hawaiian sovereignty to their, um, to their then nation. Um, that park um, was built several years later to commemorate that event, and there was an uh, effort to revitalize the park. Um, initial plans for that effort did not involve many Native Hawaiians. And the city very quickly learned um, that that was simply inappropriate. Um, people were extraordinarily angry. Um, and I was asked to help facilitate 
that process um, of, of planning the parks revitalization and making sure that those voices and other voices were heard. Um, we didn't get everything right. Uh, we couldn't involve everyone fully, but we made, I believe, good strides to have as many voices at the table as possible um, to um, ensure that at least people felt heard. Um, that they understood that while they might not get everything that they wanted, that they were certainly a part of the conversation and a valued part of the conversation. Um, that park has been revitalized uh, today. I am proud of the work that was done there. Again, it's not perfect. Um, not everyone was happy with the outcome, um, but um, by including as many voices and placing them on an equal footing, I believe that we ended up with a better park than we would have otherwise. Um, I come to you now from the Utah State Senate. That's uh, where I've been for the past five years. Um, and um, there working in state government, again, um, many opportunities to, to address um, issues of inequity um, in, our, in our governance. Um, with the uh, COVID-19 crisis that's affected us all this past year, um, I are, well, nearly a year now, um, I worked with legislators to develop a program designed to target um, outreach to Utah's um, BIPOC communities. Um, we had uh, testing sites that were mobile uh, that went to underserved areas. Um, we provided quarantine support. Um, if you're someone who, um, you know, everyone in the house works, one person is to test positive with, with COVID, how in the world are you going to quarantine? Um, it just doesn't work. And so providing resources uh, and support to both employees and the businesses they worked for to make it easier for people to quarantine and, and stop the, or at least slow the spread of the disease. Um, also working for issues um, on, on issues such as food insecurity. So um, when someone came to be tested, um, they would also meet with a social worker who would do an intake. And um, if that household needed additional resources, we would follow up with a phone call uh, in order to do additional outreach and make sure that we were supporting those communities that were um, vastly uh, more um, affected by COVID than, um, than other communities. Um, and the other big issue, of course, that's been around this year has been police reforms um, yeah, since the George Floyd, George Floyd killing and many other incidents this year. Um, of course, um, as, as, as you all well know, this has been a, a topic of great concern and discussion around the country. Um, here in Utah, we had um, you know, um, a great number of uh, protesters um, for many months um, who felt very strongly about this issue. Um, we, uh, we felt in the legislature who I worked with um, felt that there was a need to provide a, um, a forum for voices that um, wanted to show up and express their, um, their needs, their concerns, their frustrations um, in a productive manner with um, legislators who otherwise would be asking all the questions and then immediately answering their own questions without really listening to these voices. So um, we created a, a space to um, give way to those voices, to allow them to address um, the elected officials um, who are supposed to represent them and um, manage to convince the legislators to listen more than to speak. Um, and so that's how we began um, that conversation. We invited um, activists, organizations, uh, advocates to come. Uh, we had a moderator and, and just led a, a conversation, uh, giving the opportunity for legislators to really truly listen and hear, hopefully. Um, and uh, we hope that those conversations will inform their work as they come into their next legislative session in January. So that's the work I've been doing um, for the um, past several years. Um, these issues of, of equity and inequity um, have been a very much a part of my career. Um, and so this is, this is very much a you know, part of my life's work um, and something that I'm excited to continue to do with the city of Milwaukee. Um, my approach uh, in, in taking on this, this, this program uh, is to listen and to learn, to get to know the community, um, to try to build trust with members of the community as well as city employees. Um, I will be learning. I don't have all the answers, um, but I will um, listen and learn as much as I can in order to be able to help shape um, uh, solutions that um, hopefully will move you towards your goal. 
Um, I am aware that these are very difficult conversations to have. Um, you know, we're addressing issues that have impacted BIPOC communities for decades uh, and the legacy of systematic racism that dates back for centuries. Um, we're not going to solve all of this overnight. Um, but the city has taken a massive step in the right direction by making a real commitment to a sustainable future built on equity for all members of the community. And I, I want to applaud all of you um, for taking that step. That is not an easy thing to do to sort of lead out on, on these challenging issues. Um, and so, um, you know, by doing that, I think you've already laid an enormous amount of groundwork. Um, also, um, to your to your team uh, as a city, um, incredible work. As I have been uh, in meetings this, this past uh, two days, um, I, you know, I've seen how much work has been done, and I am um, so fortunate um, to have a wonderful foundation to begin my work. So uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, I, I want to thank uh, City Manager Ann Ober um, for her dedication to this issue and for the work that's been accomplished to date. Um, so um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to pick up that work and to continue moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to have you aboard and we look forward to um, learning from you and with you and um, causing actual change in, in our city. We, uh, it's something that, that this council has been um, that I've been very proud of this council about is that we don't just do uh, things for show. We we do things to actually cause change on the various issues that we we engage in. So um, I look forward to to doing that with you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Okay. So phase one is what we largely discussed at our last meeting. Um, but I think there's a few things just to highlight tonight. Um, the first is the, at the last meeting when we were talking about the intersection paintings, council made a, some recommendations on how to change that program. Those changes will all be made and the documents and website will be updated by the end of the year. So by December 31st, um, we'll send you an email when those are all updated, but council actually gave us great direction on that. So we're considering that concluded once the, the program is changed. Um, we also had our art mural unveiling uh, since that time, um, and for those of you who are watching this tonight who haven't seen it, it really is absolutely stunning. Uh, and if you're wondering what it is and you live in the city, you probably got an amazing pilot, uh, and this would be the mural uh, that was unveiled here in the city recently, done by Jeremy Okai, um, and I just Jeremy is an incredible artist. It's Jeremy Okai Davis, if you wanna look up his website. He really has done some incredible work here in the city in particular. Uh, his mural of Florence Letting is also something worth checking out at, in the Letting Library when you get a chance. Um, the listening sessions, we've provided those notes. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and then continuing to engage with staff over these conversations now that John is here. Really, that was the biggest piece is bringing John on board, helping him get integrated into the system. Um, and he's been meeting with people all week, including our engagement team earlier today. Um, and I'm just really excited about how what we can now accomplish with having some dedicated staff. The big piece for this evening for council was really to ask a couple of questions. So back in August, you approved the following resolution. I can leave this up tonight. I can come back to it in a minute if you're interested in having it up, just as a reminder about what you all did approve. Um, but the, the question that I asked was, are there whereas statements based on the listening sessions that you feel like are missing from the resolution? And are there outcomes? We really don't have outcomes in the resolution right now. We had a list of tactics. What we're looking for are things that help me and John and Luke know what we're supposed to be measuring up to, uh, what the outcomes are so that we know when things have gotten better, when we have achieved the goals that council sets forth. So, those really are the conversations that I'd like to have tonight. We have we can do those simultaneously or we can split them in half. I'm pretty open to how you want to do that. But I'd really like um, for you all also to base these in 
what you heard in the listening sessions so that the public who is watching tonight understands how the comments you heard that evening that whatever that evening was for you there were three different options um, are now reflecting into this future work so with that i'm going to stop talking and i'm going to turn it over to all of you to to start this next part of the conversation uh, i can start i've got um you know one that i think we've talked about um, and so I think that we should, you know, probably include, um, I think a measurable outcome um, is to increase participation. And, and I think that that is something that we can absolutely capture. Um, you know, we, when we have collected, um, you know, demographic information, for example, um, you know, we've, we've, we've seen, you know, where we're missing, you know, a lot of the folks in our community, um, you know, some of the most obvious the ones that jump out are, um, you know, sort of homeowner or renter status, um, income levels. Um, you know, there, that's just, you know, just a couple of examples. We could, you know, we could, we could certainly ask for, you know, folks to volunteer information about um, race or ethnicity. Um, so I think that if, if that, you know, if, if one of our desired outcomes is, is to, you know, one of our well, if one of the things we're hoping to do is 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 get more information out into you know, the communities who told us, you know, pretty pretty bluntly, we're not getting the information. You know, we're not. You know, sometimes we're not participating because we don't know. You know, about the opportunities. You know, other times it's because there are too many barriers. So, you know, those are some of the the things that there's. You know, there are tactics there. But then we also need to measure. You know, our. You know, whether or not we've. You know, through changes in some of the tactics you know, providing more translation services or, you know, continuing to provide childcare or, or, you know, engagement opportunities for children to, to be present. Um, I think those are, you know, those are tactics leading to an outcome, which is, I think, broader participation. No, I, I love that. Um, a couple of questions for you as we're talking about this. Um, one is the, the meaningfulness of that engagement. It's not just inviting people to the table, it's assuring that that content is incorporated and brought in um, in a meaningful way. So I don't know as we're working on this tonight if people are wordsmithing some ideas or if we want to have you actually leave tonight and wordsmith ideas based on this, but I'd love something that gets to the quality, not just the quantity of those, those engagement opportunities. Would meaningful participation um, help with that direction? Um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing in what Angel's saying, and, and I absolutely agree that this is a good thing that, to highlight, but I'm, I'm hearing, you know, let's, let's keep a light grasp on what the tactics might be. So I don't, I don't want to get too uh, dictatorial about that piece. Um, well, the nice thing with meaningful is I think it gives John some space to work with the BIPOC community about what meaningful means um, when we're working on our um, engagement plan around equity, our, our equity lens and our equity plan. Mm -hmm. um, but we could come back to you with a definition at a future mm -hmm. date that explains how we're defining that. Uh, but I think it definitely allows you to get information through our new Engage Milwaukee platform as well as through um, meaningful one-on-one -on -one conversations where we're having in-depth conversations with our BIPOC community and in other places. Mm -hmm. And I, I had um, done a little thinking about outcomes in advance and, and one of the ones I came up with sort of touches on this, but I don't think it's the same. So I'm not sure if, uh, I'll, I'll just drop it in chat right now so that we can, we can all look at it and you can agree or disagree or think it's not useful, um, but it was to ensure the removal of systemic racism from our laws, ordinances, and policies through robust two-way communication with Milwaukee's Black, Indigenous, and people of color residents in all aspects of city governance. Now that's really focused on policies and procedures, so that's why I don't, I don't think it captures what Angel was bringing up. Um, so but maybe it could be modified to, to also capture that. Yeah. Well, and it's great to have two. So I, I love having one specific to engagement and I love having one specific to actually having a 
quantitative change, right? A qualitative and quantitative change to our actual policies and procedures. So I'm seeing those as different, but I think they're both really impactful. Yeah, it sounds to me like that's the feedback then we want to get from the community to answer the question, you know, was this meaningful? Do you now, you know, do you hear your voice reflected in the outcome, you know, of whatever policy or, you know, decision making process that, you know, and we can, we can, that's a different measure. I mean, I think, you know, measuring the, you know, the, the income, you know, the incoming information and then also measuring, you know, like, how'd we do? Um, right. So I think that's great. Are there others? Or, I mean, I think I'm not hearing any negating of these. So I'm guessing there's a general agreement. That these are positive steps forward, but are there others people would also like? I think they're, they're great. I just wonder um, sort of, what that second one, the one in the chat, looks like um, in terms of how we prioritize. I mean, obviously we're prioritizing the police work first, but in going beyond that to other laws, ordinances, and policies. Um, you know, I think the, the notes from the listening sessions probably point us to a few that, um, that would jump out, but, um, you know, uh, reviewing our laws, policies, and, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a he heavy, that's a big universe. So I guess, how do we prioritize that? Well, and I think that that's one of the things I'm asking us to give John and our BIPOC community some time to, to think about. Um, but, you know, I, we talk a lot about the PD, but I also just want to give some credit. The planning department actually is doing an exceptional amount of this work already um, as they're working on the housing code, um, but also as we were working on comp plan in large part, thanks to the leadership of this council. So I think that um, some of, we're focusing on PD work because I need some support and help from Luke and John there, but it's not the only place where we'll be doing immediate work. I would like to come back this spring with figuring out what other policies we want to prioritize first. John and I had a have a meeting on Thursday to talk to HR about those policies for for us. Um, but but there's the sky's kind of the limit in terms of what needs to be looked at, and we'd love some help thinking about that. Yeah, and I felt like something that was broader that was clearly broader than police policies was useful and and i wanted it to be flexible because of of the you know we did hear not a ton from our listening sessions but we did hear some concerns in some other areas and i think that once we have better communication going and we have someone who's really focused on equity on board um, and and inclusion then i think um, we'll get more education going and, and once you have a greater understanding amongst our BIPOC residents of what our laws, ordinances, and policies are in the first place, that's where we start getting feedback. Um, and, and I think that that's going to be helpful. And I think, I think you're right, Lisa. I think we don't know exactly what that looks like yet. Um, but, but I think that there's, there's work to be done there. Seems to me that with the kinds of things that we've been initiating recently, the listening sessions we've had and the outcomes from that and the types of um, education and training that we've been doing, have planned to do with John coming on board and a variety of things. Um, it seems to me that we should see how those things play out and then see what still comes back to us at that point or what we continue to hear from the community and then look at what do we need to reassess or redetermine because I, I'm not sure there's enough information right now to be as specific as it sounds like we're looking for. I actually really appreciate how broad it is. I think that um, it gives staff a lot of room to work with the community 
to come back to you. One of the things that's going on right now is that Clackamas County did a SWOT analysis of what's happening for our BIPOC community in the region. We received that document on Friday. I'd also like to see that. I'd like to understand how cities in the region are or are not or are failing actually at providing support for our BIPOC community before I, I go too far anyway. But I think all of the things that you've presented here are ways that I could measure our actions from the standing today to a future tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I, I like all the things we're talking, talking about so far. Um, the one thing that's I've, I've always felt wasn't included in this resolution and we haven't really addressed is, I mean, put it a little bit differently. What we, what we are doing so far, what we are, the processes we're putting in place so far are um, like preparing to do a climate action plan for city operations. Right. It's, it's we're doing all the things that we need to do within the function of the city to to address racism. What we haven't touched on and, and maybe there is no easy solution. I mean, the art pieces are a, a beginning. Right. But what we haven't really touched on in this resolution doesn't really address is. Processes or efforts uh, in, in the broader community outside of city operations, um, what, what would that look like? And, and we may not have the answers now, but I would like to see that somehow addressed or noticed or thought about in the resolution um, as to how we can start to um, lead, uh, whatever, uh, our city, all the people in our city in, in this direction. Well, and I will say that um, I heard from one of my neighbors who was very interested before we even got our first round of notes from the listening sessions in those and sort of how we replicate that on a broader scale for more of the community. You know, how we, what sort of dialogue can we have, you know, that can engage bigger parts of the community? But don't you also think that we help guide that by the leadership of the city council looking at how the city operates and what the city policies are and and maybe maybe that's something that we, you know, spend more time talking to NDA leaders about. I mean, there's, you know, other other kinds of things like that, but I'm trying to trying to think about how how we could help those new inferences spread throughout. And I think that what we're doing right now is a great beginning in that and that it spreads by leadership. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't I don't disagree with that, but I guess I think that, um, you know, and, and in COVID, you know, it's hard, you know, because yeah. I wouldn't necessarily want to have these conversations. I mean, it'd be better to be having them in a room, but the city has before had uh, emergency preparedness lecture series or some kind of, um, and I don't know that I would, would want it to be a lecture series per se, but some sort of um, community, uh, you know, you know, once a month gatherings, once when we can gather again, you know, mm -hmm. where there's topics that are discussed or, you know, whatever. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it could take all kinds of, of forms, but I right. do think doing some public engagement that goes, I take the mayor's point about doing some public stuff that is not necessarily just about city functions. Well, I think there's, there are, are groups. Um, I mean, I, I think that this is an opportunity where the city recognize, you know, that it shouldn't be the leader necessarily, or even the, you know, the convener, but maybe more of a sponsor, you know, or a partner, um, you know, in conversations that are sort of gathering steam and already taking place in our community 
So mm -hmm. creating space, supportive space. I mean, we, you know, we give each NDA four thousand dollars. You know, um, for you know for, to to do you know to do what they do, and they do great things. Um, you know, we should we should be considering, you know, sponsor. You know, doing that kind of you know support you know making sure that other community groups are are supported so that you know where these conversations are already taking place that you know they feel like you know that is supported by the city you know and you know for example you know i i know that you know there's there are folks right now who are trying you know who you know because of covid it's not probably not it's not gathering as many people as as we would like to see moving forward but chapel theater is is you know, is already doing, you know, some of what we're talking about here. And so, um, you know, giving resources to those conversations that are already taking place in the community. Yeah, so, I, agree. Absolutely. I agree with, I agree with that. But I, I think, I think too, that the actions the city council is taking and has taken in the last few months, give people sort of, I can't think of the right word, but I'll just say it gives people a foundation, a legitimacy to to copy, to do the same, to reach out and say, yeah, there's things that need to change or that we need to do or that we need to be more inclusive or God, I never realized that X, Y, Z was going on and let's make sure it doesn't happen in the future. So again, I think I think that's a really important place for the city is to be that foundation and that that acceptance that these kind of discussions and this kind of movement is okay. So just bringing us back to the resolution, what I'm hearing is uh, an outcome that would be, and I, this is not the right word, but growing the team. Somehow we grow, we, cr we support and we um, embolden actions of other organizations to create the experience and culture that we're trying to do here through this resolution so that it's not simply it's not enough that we accomplish these things that we are supporting the accomplishments of the surrounding neighbor NGOs other government agencies who also support our families in accomplishing those goals well, and, and just the residents of the city I, I, I mean I what one of the things that struck me and concerned me deeply when I was listening to the two listening sessions I was in were, were stories about how people were treated by their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And um, nothing we're doing here necessarily will have any effect on that. But as an example, uh, during the LSC conference, the two black mayors of, of Oregon uh, spoke at length uh, to, the, to the mayors gathering uh, the first morning. And it was extraordinary. I think most of us were in tears by the end of, of their talk. They were very vulnerable. They were very um, unfiltered in a way and, and spoke their truth, told their life story in a way. And I think that most white Americans have no actual concept of, of of what people of color experience. And I, I watched faces, hard faces from the east side of the mountain soften very deeply during this. And I think, you know, the more that we can either support uh, other entities like Chapel Theater to do something like that or and or co-sponsor but I just, I feel like there needs to be something within our resolution that addresses the broader community and not just our city operations, put it as simply as possible. Yeah. Can I, can I try Please. some language here? Uh, I'll drop it in chat again. And I, again, this was one I had pre-written and I just modified, <clears throat> excuse me, and it may or may not work because I'm sort of on the fly. I uh, pulled down. If anybody needs me to reshare the screen, I will, but this is easier for us to all talk through. Sure. So uh, in case anyone's attend in attendance, uh, create a citywide culture that seeks to understand and address the barriers to equity and inclusion faced by our historically underrepresented residents. This will include supporting the broader community engaging with equity and inclusion work. 
I think it sounds reasonable. John, is that clear to you? Does that give you what you're looking for? <laughs> I think it does. Um, it's certainly, I, mean, I may have more questions, uh, clarifying questions, just working on it, but first glance, um, I think it definitely points us in a, in a clear direction. I think this gets to where I was going. I might want to wordsmith it a little bit with you, Kathy, you know, sure. meetings over, but yeah. Yes. Yeah, the basic idea is there, the concept, everything we've been talking about. Yeah. So, so far I've heard three things. I've heard engagement, measuring and engagement. I've heard measuring our policy shift. And I've heard engaging sort of uh, growing the equity work of others in, in this area. So in our regional area. Am I missing any sort of broad concepts at this point? Okay, keep well, going. Yeah. Lisa? Well, so one of the things that was clear from the um, set of notes, this last set of notes of the Spanish language listening session is the lack of materials in the language, right? And that's a struggle to figure out, you know, where, you know, how much to do in the language and I know with the uh, comp plan they're definitely doing a fair amount in Spanish. Um, we also have a sizable Russian speaking population here and they aren't BIPOC but they are a uh, an underserved uh, community and marginalized community and I think we have to keep them in mind as well and sort of how do we figure out how much to translate and what to translate and well, and so the way I've been treating the translation discussion is that that would fit into our engagement um, verbiage in the resolution that we would come back to. I do actually have a, a part of tonight where we're going to talk very specifically about translation uh, services that came out of the listening session and a, and a discussion with you all about costs and about how we want to go through a budgeting process moving forward. So we will get there. I'm not sure, do you feel like we need to have translation services be a specific call out as an outcome for this? Um, or is it, does the engagement piece, if we if we write it correctly, does it capture that? Yeah, I think it can. Okay. It can, yeah. I agree, I think that can be rolled into the engagement piece. Okay. Um, I think one thing that also came out of, you know, the listening sessions and, and other conversations, um, you know, that's certainly measurable, um, you know, is the lack of representation um, in our in our staff and also on this council. Um, you know, I'm not, it's, hold on, Jess. Um, so, and, and this probably goes along with, you know, sort of the, you know, ensuring the removal of, of you know, systemic racism in our policies, um, you know, but then, you know, where's the, where's then, you know, where, then where are we measuring it? You know, if, you know, if the, out, if the desired outcome is a more representative city, um, you know, are we, are we actually measuring whether or not we're achieving that? So oh, this is a council resolution, which means that I would ask that the resolution focus on the pieces within your purview. I do think that there are things that we could put in here that aren't necessarily captured under policy that get at what you're, you're speaking about, Council President. Um, your boards and commissions is definitely a place where I think that that is absolutely appropriate and falls fully within the control of this council how you all engage with people to get them to run to first city council and how you choose to engage in that political process is absolutely within the purview. So I, if you all are interested in one, I think it's, it sounds really smart. I also want to be clear to anybody who's watching that is not me saying I am not committed to it on my side of the, the table here. It is simply a, this is council's resolution about the policy work of the city. Yeah, I mean, maybe there's not a direct, you know, there's not a direct way for this council, but I mean, you know, and, and please, Anne, this is not, this is also not like, please don't take this the wrong way, because I, I, I don't know how to other, otherwise say it, but, you know, this council does hire 
the city manager. And if that policy, you know, if, if, if this council says that, you know, that certain, you know, that, that certain policies, you know, you know, need to, need to, you know, need to bring about certain outcomes, then I think that that, that's, that's an indirect sort of thing that, you know, if that's a priority of this council and, and this city, you know, we would, we could still put it in there, even if it's sort of couched in this kind of like super, you know, this language about policy. Um, and yes, there are definitely things that this, that this council, you know, in terms of on the city council, re you know, representation side, you know, we could be advocating for a more equitable form of, of elections, for example, you know, we're all elected at large. We may really need to be considering whether to put, you know, refer something out to the voters, you know, if annexation happens and we've all of a sudden got, you know, this whole other part of the city that is going to be, you know, electing representatives as well. You know, there could be a different, elect, you know, there could be ranked choice, there could be districts, there are lots of things that we could be maybe talking to our community about in order to make, to, to try to get more representation on this council. That's kind of going, that's a little bit of an offshoot, but that's, that's where my head's at anyway when I sure. think about these things. You all can fire me, absolutely 100%, and you all get three people. No, no, I know, but I'm just saying you all do control the hiring of three people. That's absolutely within your control and purview. Um, I'm saying that I'm not comfortable because of, I prefer not to go down the path of measuring within a council resolution uh, the employment. It does not mean that I don't take it very seriously. I also, without having the attorney on this call, am a little concerned about what I am allowed and how I am allowed to count people and what that looks like. So um, that's a different issue, but it is one that is also a concern to me. And I, I'm, um, Councilor Faulkner, I hear you. I do. And I'm, um, I don't mean to be flippant and sometimes my jokes aren't funny. So I also am not um, offering up my resignation here, nor am I feeling threatened. <laughs> I am simply saying you do actually, you do control three employees and I do actually respect that a great deal. Um, so if you all wanted to, to make comments within this resolution around that, I would totally support it. Um, but for me, the, there's just some interesting boundaries in there. Well, and, and I also wonder if this is a place where the conversation isn't so much about outcomes, but is up in the language above where, you know, because we did have a point in there where we said we would further our own education. I absolutely think we ought to make a commitment as city council to, um, to something along the lines of, of increasing uh, rep representation of the underrepresented uh, in Milwaukee on our boards and commissions. And, um, you know, and if there's some way to phrase that to include in encouraging staffing choices that are um, more inclusive, then we could do that too. I mean, I, I feel like that's already present. I, I know that's already present, um, but it is not stated expri explicitly. Um, so that would be my suggestion of how we how we incorporate that. I think something along those lines is fine. I'm good with that area. Again, something we'll have to craft carefully and run past the attorney and city manager and all those sorts of things. But anything else, anybody? Well, a big part of the work we're doing um, is really the work that Luke and Anne and the police department are doing um, and I really appreciate how much effort they have already put into thinking about our policies and procedures in the police department and about increasing transparency and and really um, developing some solid relationships. I, I think that it's been terrific. Um, so when I put this language forward it is not meant to be a 
criticism. It's just an acknowledgement of the work that's already been done and that it's ongoing and, and a sense that, um, you know, from the listening sessions, it's clear that, that people do feel like there's work to be done and I don't want them to feel like we didn't hear that. Um, so the other one that I would suggest is uh, foster trust in the Milwaukee Police Department's commitment to the safety and well-being of all residents and especially our BIPOC residents. So what does that mean? How do you, how do you foster trust? Yeah. And how is that measurable? You know, and, and we've heard a few comments about not being comfortable or not having trust, but we've also heard so much more on the positive side of our police department mm -hmm. and what a great job they do. And we're just now beginning to get into things like, you know, the, you know, de-escalation training and uh, equity training and that. And we're, we're talking about things that we don't know yet where, what the results or the outcomes of that are going to be. And so therefore what else needs to be done or not done or mm -hmm. whatever. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've, and you know this, but we've, the police department has been doing de-escalation for years and has invested heavily in de-escalation training for a long time. That's part of the culture of the police department. And, and again, this is not meant to say that this is not happening. I, I absolutely think that the, the police department and, and Luke and the leadership are, are working very hard, um, to address this. So when I say foster trust in the Milwaukee Police Department, I, I mean something that we can ask about in community surveys. Um, and we can break that down by demographics and see if we have a split. And I don't know. I don't know if there's a split right now. We do get very, very positive. You know, Our police department is the most popular thing we do in our community surveys. Um, I don't know if there's a demographic shift there. There may not be. We may have, you know, 75% of BIPOC residents who think that it's, it's terrific. I don't know. So you're right, there's a lot we don't know. Um, and if yeah. the language isn't broad enough to, to reflect that kind of openness and looseness, then absolutely we should not use it. Um, I'm just trying to figure out some way that we can show our residents that, that, that we do have an outcome that is specific to uh, the work of our police department because it is such a huge piece of the work that we've been doing and, and will continue to do. Yeah, I'm just, I, it, I, I get the whole concept. I'm just not sure how we foster trust. We have an opportunity to um, educate, mm -hmm. to build trust, to Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not sure what the words are. I'm not as good a wordsmith on the fly as some people are, but. Well, and I think, I think the things we're doing are fostering trust. The, the simple act of, you know, in the listening session I was a part of, simply the fact that we asked people to sit down and have a conversation with us about how they're treated in the city um, built trust. Uh, I agree. Interested. I agree. So maybe it's more provide opportunities to build trust, you mm. know, or something. I'm yeah. Well, I guess I liked um, the point you started with when you started talking, Kathy, which was transparency and mm -hmm. sort of enhancing the transparency of policing and um, you know, that there has been work started on that. Um, and, um, but making, you know, our, uh, all of our policies much more user-friendly or e more easily accessible, um, as well as the, the actual substantive review of them that's going to happen. But, um, I definitely think that the work the staff has been doing is based in trust and transparency. I think that that's, that those two things are where, and I'm speaking for him, even though he's on this call. Um, but that's where Luke has been spending all this time. It's the websites that we've been working on. It's, um, it's the engagement with our BIPOC community around our trainings and our policies that we're going to talk about later tonight. 
So I definitely think that it's measurable. Um, we have a we have a number of things we have been doing, and then it's measurable to see if they actually created more trust through the transparency through our community survey. Yeah. Um, but I should also say part of this is I I have not pulled out I have not pulled apart the survey results. Uh, for the police department from the last survey to look at how the demographics shifted depending on um, the demographics. So I would need to go back and look at that. I do kind of like where you were going with that, uh, Councillor Heisey. Um, although there could be room to wordsmith it still. Uh, but maybe just adding some of that language around creating systems and opportunities designed to build or foster uh, that trust because uh, whether it's in those statements or not, that does seem to be a key part of what we're doing um, is creating those systems and opportunities. Um, and the listening sessions obviously are an example of that, um, but continuing to look for those opportunities um, will I think be key to this moving forward. Can you send me that? That was really smart. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Are people generally okay with how Luke just wordsmith that if you yeah, were to come up was, with some language? Yeah, okay. that was great. Yeah, for sure. See, I should have just made you do this from the get go. <laughs> I feel like so I feel like we have four or five things that are um, definitely clear about how we can measure our success around this goal. I really appreciate that. Um, so based on this this discussion, we'll go back and we'll wordsmith it um, with those of you who said in the meeting that you had specific interest in wordsmithing on a specific one. Um, and then we'll bring it back for consideration by council. Does that work? Just so you know, I will also probably, uh, if if this works for you, take that modified version and put it out to our listserv, um, our BIPOC listserv, and ask for feedback prior to coming back to council. I've got yeah. another request. I'm sorry I didn't no, catch it great. last time around. Um, if I, there's just a couple of wording, you know, sort of uh, capitalization of black and also um, I, it's a little, the wording gets a little bit funky when we're not abbreviating, you know, BIPOC community. Um, so I think, you know, in like, for example, you know, the first one in the chat here, um, you know, if, if we, if we might say, you know, at the, you know, we say Milwaukee's black indigenous and residents of color, um, or, you know, or we, or we simply say, you know, BIPOC residents, um, you know, just to make it a little bit more language, you know, flowing, yeah. or, you know. I love that. Is there any, Angela, are you seeing any of that inside the existing resolution or really just in the terminology that we're adding? Sorry, you're on mute now. Sorry, I, certainly the capitalization. Um, okay. And then I think if it does, I, I, haven't, I don't have it pulled up right in front of me right now, but. We'll send it over to you. That's not a big deal. Okay. Okay, so are we generally feeling like this gets us to a place where you all are good with the resolution, the modifications. I'll bring it back in December when John is back so he can actually lead that discussion. And then we will move forward uh, with when we do staff reports and when we bring things forward to you, we'll measure against those outcomes. I think it'd be good to send it out ahead of when you put it in the packet so that we all kind of get our Oh, you're individually helping me write this. I just can't have you all doing it together. So Right. But uh, we will make sure that everybody has a lot of time with this thing before it goes forward. John, did you have any thoughts or suggestions, things that we might have missed or? I think that, um, you know, particularly with the um, addition from Luke, I think that that really uh, clarifies what, what you're looking for on the, on the police, uh, policing section. Um, I think, I think these, these are, 
you know, I, 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 coming in right now, sort of just listening, I would hate to sort of, you know, push a new idea out into the, into the world without really being aware of all of the uh, issues in the community. But um, based on what I've heard, what I've seen uh, to date, and looking at some of the, the past reports, um, I think that you've captured a lot of what was uh, discussed in those, in those listening sessions. This is good. Okay, thanks. Fresh eyes are always helpful. Certainly. Okay, we are going to go back to screen sharing um, the PowerPoint and we will continue. Um, okay, so translation services. Uh, during one of the listening sessions and after from a couple of our BIPOC community members, there was a request that we actually translate the pilot or portions of the pilot. So the staff went out and looked at some options. Um, and this is where we landed. The reason that I, um, so I wanna talk about this briefly tonight, but I also want to make sure that we are making decisions with comparative decisions, right? So other options, not just accepting options, um, because I, we only have so much money. And I wanna make sure that the things that we're investing in are the things that help us reach the goal at the highest level. And John, this is his second day of work third, I think. So I want to give him some time to think about this. However, it was requested and I wanted to share with you what we learned. So the two options are that we could fully translate the pilot into Spanish. Um, the cost of that's about $10,000 additional per year. Um, if we then mailed it to first class Spanish, uh, mailed at first class to Spanish speaking households, we think we have about 400 Spanish speaking households in the area that would be about $3,000 more per year. Option two that we talked about um, is a little less expensive, um, and that would just be translating four of the pages within the pilot, printing it all in one set, and sending it to every household, uh, and that's $9,000. So that gets it into more households. Um, but again, the option that I have today without knowing where I have a funding source from would be to limit the number of pilots that we actually send, i.e. the number of issues we do each year. Right now we do, I believe, a, a 10 issues. This would take us down closer to six or seven, which seems like a really big cut in the work that um, we've done, especially around engagement. Can I jump in real quick? We do 11 issues currently, and then the math on this one was you could afford it if you drop down to 10, was sort of okay. the calculation that I was making in this chart. Sorry for the confusion. Now I'm going to let Kelly keep talking. No. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this was just assuming that you don't have any additional resources at play. How would you figure out how to, how could you figure out how to pay for it? And so on both of these, you'll see that by dropping down to 10. Um, and we did budget a few thousand dollars for translation services in the city manager's budget just because we knew we would have a need. It's not a lot. If you drop the number of issues and you throw the translation budget at it, you get close um, to covering both these options. So that's what this is showing you. Um, I will tell you, it's not great um, to pick which month you don't do um, of the pilot. So I don't know how feasible it is to really go to 10. I just, this was how I could make the kind of the budget math work if it's something that we were going to, to do now with an existing resources. Does that help, Ann? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I think this also, just to make sure, since it came up earlier in the night, Councillor Beatty, this is only one language of translation services. A second language would double that cost. Right. So is there a way to, I mean, if we were to do option two, is there also a way to online have a, have a full um, pilot in, both Spanish and in Russian, if online. So, I don't know what the cost of that is. Yeah, do you mind if I jump in, Ann? Um, or rest of council, is that okay if I respond to this part? So there's kind of three primary chunks of cost. Since we do the pilot in-house, we get a scream and deal on design and layout and on graphics, because that's all Jordan. Um, we, um, then we pay, we pay printing, and we have a range, we can add a certain number of pages within our contract um, and, and that gets covered. Postage goes up any new 
any new home we mail it to. Um, and then there's the translation and the translation for the full pilot is about $1,000 an issue. So I would pay that $1,000 for Spanish and then I would pay that $1,000 for Russian. So once you add that second language, I get it. You're going to add an, that cost per month. Adding it to the web costs nothing, right? So once I've done the translation, once it's laid out, putting it a digital version on the web, it, it doesn't, there's no increased cost in that. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see when you're doing a limited mailing, you don't add a ton of additional cost to just mail to specific households. Um, there's, there are other implications that come in in terms of the production timeline, how long it takes us to then have the, the, the pilot early enough on so that we can get it to the translators, other things I won't get into. Um, but the minute you add another language, if we're paying for full pilot translation, it's about a thousand dollars is what I, the early estimates that I got. Okay. And so, we outsource the printing. We don't do the printing in house. We, we outsource the printing right now. So we outsource the printing to Pamplin. Um, and they, um, and it's actually a pretty good deal. Um, yeah. For us, for the way we can get the cost down though, um, potentially for additional languages, um, is to print those in-house. We would print those ourselves. And you'll notice on option one, we're actually doing a little bit of a, a lower graphic version of it so that we can take it. We would just, we would get it done. We would put the digital version online and then we would print the digital version. Um, it may not be quite as laid out as the printed version as it is today. It would look pretty close. Um, and then we would just mail that first class to people that request it. That's what option one is. Have we, I mean, I'm just trying to brainstorm and think about various things and having done several newsletters through chambers of commerce you know i have a little bit of background on it but have we thought about doing i mean if we want if we want to focus on having these the translations i mean obviously the one the spanish is really important i think the russian is important also but that may be just online or something but have we thought about doing a hard copy newsletter one month and a digital the sec next month, but maybe you include a little bit more information in the hard copy newsletter of that one month. Do you get what I'm saying? Like every mm -hmm. other month that's online instead of printed. Yeah. I actually, I did six options. Well, <laughs> and that was not one of my options. <laughs> And that's a pretty good one. Um, so um, no, there's different iterations that we could we could play out on here. And obviously, the the fewer number of printed editions you do, the more room you're going to have in the budget for um, translation. Um, so that exactly. is one thing you could do. We also did look at a, a mini pilot, a pilot light, you might call it, uh -huh. um, that would be a smaller Spanish only kind of almost a separate edition. That's what Hillsboro does. Um, anyway, I'm going way down a rabbit hole that Ann didn't want me to go down. The point is, there's actually a lot of different things you can do, depending on these outcomes are great. And depending on the outcomes you all are setting, um, I think it would take us in a different, it will take us down a different path, depending on what you tell us. So if you're telling us we want kind of everything and we want it in multiple languages, that'll take us down one path. If you yeah. tell us essential information just in Spanish, that would take us down a different path. And it kind of depends on who it is you're trying to reach. So I think where Anne was hoping to get to tonight is if to tell you we're, we're taking it seriously, we think there are paths, but you may want to wait until you're evaluating different engagement and translation needs altogether um, so that you don't spend all your money tonight on this one thing and then don't have the resources you want to maybe do something that's of higher value to you. So um, I think this is mostly just to show you some ingredients. That we heard people. Yeah, that we have to work with and that we do think we can get to a solution depending on which direction you want us to go. Yep. So can okay. I ask a just a couple clarifying questions? One is the second option was four pages. So you would just pick the four pages, that's half the pilot basically would come in Spanish. So yeah. one of the pieces that we heard, sorry, just because no, I was sorry. a part of these conversations with some of our BIPOC community, the, con the conversations I heard were, there were things that are critical for people to know and there are things that are interesting. So making sure that the critical to know and, all, and very specifically around engagement, so things like the calendar, 
and the events and ways that you can connect with the community that those needed to be translated. I added, I asserted that I also thought we needed to translate things. If we were talking about water quality or if we were talking about services um, that were new, that would help people in their personal worlds, that those were the types of things we really needed to make sure were translated. I was less focused on things like, um, sorry, but the council corner um, being whether or not that was really something that every single person needs to read in a translated service. Um, one of the concerns I also heard around that was translating something does change its meaning sometimes. Um, and the way you write when you're writing a council corner are very, um, the words are very important for the full meaning and there would be a risk that we would actually shift the meaning of a sentence accidentally for you all that would have a negative outcome. And so we were a little bit cautious on that front too. So I was really, if we were gonna go down this path, I was looking for must know information being translated. And that's actually where Kelly and Jordan got a little nervous was, oh, you want us to decide what's a must must know, so I have an odd feeling I would be the person who would be tasked with that decision on a regular basis. I think, and if I can just interject, because I think it brings up an important, you know, distinction between translation and, um, you know, interpretation. And I think that there's, you know, lots of nuance in language, you know, you know, just between, you know, between dialects and, and, and also, you know, between, you know, from one speaker to another. Um, and so I, I do think there's real risk in getting it wrong. You know, and I think that that's where, you know, critical information can be translated, not interpreted, and the meaning, the meaning is not going to be lost and, and the impact won't be harmful, you know, if it's done incorrectly. Um, I do think with more of the, you know, obviously Council Corner is, is one place where that could go completely off the rails, um, you know, and, and there's a big distinction between translation and, and interpretation. Well, what's your distinction? I mean, interpretation is oral. Well, I think that the way I've heard, you know, friends of mine make a distinction between translation and, 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 and interpretation is that voice, dialect, lots of, lots of things go into that that matter. It's not just, you know, vocabulary and, you know, making sure that your, you know, noun, verb, you know, uh, agree with each other. Um, it's, it's, it's nuance, it's um, context that, that can be lost. And so maybe you're, you know, maybe you're thinking about it in a different way than I am, but I understand there to be a distinction that has a lot more to do with, you know, sort of the context, the context in which the listener is hearing it. Uh, and also the way, you know, especially, you know, for, for a piece like what we, you know, some of us tend sometimes write in the council corner, you know, some of that could be lost, um, lost in translation. Yeah. So, so if you all are comfortable just to try and pull this back um, to tonight, I don't, I'm not recommending that we make a decision tonight. I'm showing you the complexity of the decisions. That's really what we're trying to do here. Um, what I'd like to recommend is, well, I, I do have one question, which is how many language is, if I'm doing this, are we talking about? Are we talking about one or two? And then the second question is, um, I'd like to take this then out to the same participants from our listening sessions and ask them um, if they have a preference or what their thoughts are, because it, it came out of the Spanish spoken listening session very directly. Um, so. Those are, I think, my two closing questions for this. So, so you would ask them what? Help, help me understand more what you'd be going out to them for. Because first of all, I got the impression not a lot of them read the pilot, so they wouldn't even have a full knowledge of it. And do they know what's in it so that they could determine what's important to them or not? Or are you just asking them about should it be in a separate language? I think there's a lot of factors in that question. I've already heard from them and from other community members that they'd like to have a portion of this translated. I think my question to them is, is it is the critical information is four pages, does that get you 80% of the way there? Do you feel like we're communicating in a strong way with you if, if we have critical information translated on a monthly basis? 
or do you really only get about 30% of the way if we don't do the whole thing? I, I guess that's really kind of the measurement I'm trying to figure out is, is it that you feel like we're not giving you any information? Is it that we f you feel like you want to be included in all information? When I heard what, what I heard in the listening sessions to me was there's some things we really need to know and you're not making an attempt. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was focusing on the things to be respectful and critical to at least get the things translated to our Spanish spoken community around the things they need, need to know for their own safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I was in one of the Spanish speaking groups as well. And, um, and I, I think that's all, that all sounds really sensible and reflects what I heard. My only lingering question is, um, you know, one of the things that we also heard was just a, a complete lack of familiarity with how the city works and what it does. And so is there a need for a translation of the pilot or is there a need for us to further consider how we, how we do outreach to this community and what we give to them? Um, and if we're talking about spending $10,000 to be more inclusive, um, then I'm not sure that translating the pilot is is the thing we do in order to meet the needs that I heard from the Spanish speaking um, session. So I just I guess I want to kind of keep it a little bigger picture too, without completely erasing everything that we just talked about. <laughs> no, I love that. And I think that that's part of why I'm really glad John is here. Um, and why I didn't want to make a decision tonight. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that's come up to me now several times since we started this work is the need for celebrating different cultures, mm -hmm. the need to celebrate the big moments, the, the things that are important to families here in Milwaukee, and those cost money, but they're really important. And I think $10,000 could go a long way, especially if we also had materials available at those events to reaching people that we may not reach with the pilot. I just don't know. And I think that it, it deserves more research and time, but that's kind of where I'm at tonight. And it looks like Kelly turned her camera back on so she could talk again. You know? I think it just happened. I think it just like popped up again. I didn't change anything. I was making sure Tommy got the end of Girl Scouts. That's what I was just doing. Uh, but time. I stand ready to help whenever we're ready to do. And ne next year is a good time for us to make a transition um, with a pilot or, uh, you know, if, if that's the direction we head in. So I think we've pulled together the right information we need on our end to help deploy um, whatever tactic we want to we wanna use. So m I had one thought uh, in looking at the two options that, that you guys presented. Um, in the one option, the fact that we are doing it in Spanish is invisible to the non-Spanish population, which gets back to my interest in the resolution in having something that is setting a tone or helping the rest of the community grow. I kind of like having the translations within the pilot itself that goes out to everyone mm -hmm. so that we are saying to everyone, it is important that everyone can read this, right? That, that as many people as possible can read what, what we're putting out. So that just from that standpoint, I prefer that model. And that makes me think about, um, you know, is there, do we have capacity to, while well, we're still sorting out exactly what we do, to just start including a, a Spanish language corner in every edition of the pilot sooner rather than later? Um, and it could, you know, we could say, just have a paragraph, a very small piece that's about, hey, we've had these listening sessions. Um, you know, if you'd like to see the transcripts, we've got them, here's the link. It's, on, it's available online. Or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think if there are ways that we can start to build an awareness within the Spanish speaking community that this, this could be a tool 
to connect with the community um, at a broader level and to understand what the city is doing. And then we go from there to whatever it is we do with greater outreach. Do you see where I'm going? Like we just start, you start building your audience is, is really what I'm thinking about here. Well, and you could do the a corner or you could actually have every headline of every piece in the pilot have underneath it a Spanish and a Russian version. And so at least people know there's something here, here's the core, if, if, even though the whole text isn't translated, they have, they know there's more to ask for, or, you know, I think that's not terribly satisfactory unless we have a full translation online or somewhere that they can go to, but there's ways to, yeah, I don't know. I am, I do wanna, pull back to that very comment though. Um, are we trying to translate, if we can't translate in both, are we not translating in either? So does it need to be Spanish and Russian or are we, what's, what's sort of the thought process here? Well, what's our numbers? Well, it's $10,000. Oh, you mean of people. I actually asked for that to be pulled. Um, I don't have it for you tonight, but I did ask for the number of families that that would impact. And it's a, it, it's a more nuanced question too, is numbers of, of folks that speak that language that don't really speak or at least read English too. And I know that's really hard to get at, but- um, I don't know how we'd know that. That's yeah. the data point we need, right? Mm -hmm. I was supposed to get it from community development. If I can get it by the end of the meeting, I'll, I'll give it to you. Okay. Let me see if I can pull it real quick. Okay, so we're gonna come back to that question at the end of the night, but we'll keep going for now. Does that work? Okay. Uh, let's go back to sharing my screen. Okay, so um, as we were noting, the phase two is really focused on the policing work. The, we're doing this for a couple of reasons. One is that, um, A, it's a commitment that I made. Uh, it's a commitment that Luke's been making to a lot of people, but also because we're moving into union negotiations this, this spring. And so we wanted to have this work largely completed so that you all were able to receive some feedback around um, any changes that that the BIPOC community would like to see with the union contract. Um, and you could have those before you go into negotiations with our team. Um, so our plan right now is that we would be pulling this group together. We're doing two workshops. Let me see, here we go. Actually, let me stick with that for a minute um, before I go into the workshops. So right now, the way we're engaging with our community is um, Luke, has actually been working with some of the individuals who have reached out to us about traffic enforcement in particular around how our BIPOC community experiences being pulled over. Um, and so he's been meeting and will continue to meet next week with some of our BIPOC community members around that experience and a training that he's developed for our officers. Uh, we did receive some feedback back and it sounds like he, he did a great job on how he developed that and I really appreciate that. Um, so he is doing that work immediately. He's also been working on a police transparency website. This is where we are going to be putting the stops data uh, that we, when we get it in December, it's also where we will have updated policies, where we will have the union contract. We're trying to make it as accessible, not just available, but accessible on that site as possible. So he's been working with um, our with his own staff and then with our website team in order to figure out a way to make that very engaging. Upcoming in this next phase are going to be this review process. Um, and we are, we've, with the help of Kelly, created some workshops, two workshops with some BIPOC community members to review um, both the policies and the union contract. Uh, I included here, I don't know if you all remember, but a year, year and a half ago, we had a community member who asked us to look at the um, Campaign Zero's policy recommendations for union contract amendments. So we've actually pulled those, we've provided those to our, um, our attorney, 
and um, we're going to provide those in full to the group that we're working with. Uh, we're expecting that this will take two meetings to go through these uh, because we've done a lot of the work. We're not asking people to wordsmith, they can, but we're trying to make this uh, as pain-free as possible uh, because reading policies is pretty painful. Um, so we've been trying to do a lot of the legwork in advance and then we'll sit down with everyone and, and see how we did and make additional changes prior to moving forward. But we're using Campaign Zero as the, the litmus test for what policies need to be considered for the union contract. We would ask for a prioritized lit list for all of you so that you would know in our community what are the highest priorities off of that list for consideration going into the union negotiations. Luke, did I miss anything? I don't think so. We didn't specifically mention that out of the listening sessions, uh, uh, there were obviously a lot of questions uh, that we received from our uh, community members. And we've been in the process of uh, putting together answers for those questions. So that is also taking place um, in a format that we can then share with the public. Those will be up on our website and available to all of you. Okay. And then um, this really is John's work. Um, so we've received some requests about doing some sort of board committee task force. Um, and we are looking at an equity task force moving in this next phase. We wanted John here first to figure out how to utilize a team of people so we're not wasting people's time, but also receiving feedback. Our commitment throughout this period all the way through into May and forward is that we will continue to engage with our BIPOC community um, on everything that we're gonna be working on. So um, that, that is a part of it. Our community survey is going to be coming up again. And all of this is building up to our next budget, uh, knowing that we need an equity lens for review of our budget because money is, your, is what's important to you, right? Like money, where you put your money shows your values. And so we're trying to make sure that we have the review process ready for that budget and that we also have um, an engagement process with our BIPOC community before we get to that process. Uh, and that's why right now you'll see that phase three actually ends at May of 22. It does not mean that we expect the goal will end, but I could only plan out as far as the budget cycle without John being here. Okay. These are everyone's email addresses. So if someone is watching tonight and you'd like to reach out to me, to John or to Luke, uh, this is how you can find us. Uh, we'd love to sit down with you personally and have a discussion about your thoughts, ideas or concerns. Um, and we will of course make this available on the website so people can find us easily. I didn't talk much about it, but we are in our Engage Milwaukee webpage, which um, I have previously called Bang the Table, but this is actually our, our formatted page for the city, will be launched officially on Thursday. We're launching it for the comprehensive plan. So that'll be the first time that we'll utilize that tool. But there will be a similar page created moving forward for our equity work. Um, so you can expect to find this on our equity page for now, but you'll also be able to find it on our engagement, Engage Milwaukee equity page in the future. Okay. What else? Y'all are fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Hang John. Hang John. I just got here. Um, <laughs> no, no, thank you all, um, and, and and really to the to the city uh, team for putting in this work. I mean, it, it's an enormous amount of work that's been done to date, and I'm looking forward to jumping in and joining joining in the fun. And and thanks to all of you, councilors and mayor, um, for your commitment to this. It's really important. So thank you. Thanks for joining us, John. It's been a really Great pleasure meeting you and hope to get to do that in person at some point. 
Definitely looking forward to it at some point. Well, and I forgot to say this, but for our BIPOC community, John is going to be holding a meet and greet over Zoom when he comes back to us in December. So that is actually going to be on Thursday. I want to say the 10th. I'm looking right now. I think that's right. Um, it is going to be on December 10th. Uh, and it's going to be at 6 p.m. If you're interested in attending, you can send an email to any of the email addresses we just had pulled up. Uh, you can drop something to me at any time at oberA at milwaukeeoregon.gov. Um, but we would love to have you participate. This really is a chance for our BIPOC community to talk about work that has been done, work that isn't being done yet, and um, any questions or concerns they have about where we should be going. So I appreciate the help from Hannah and from Brenna in setting that up. Uh, we'll be putting it up on Facebook in the coming weeks as well to encourage people to sign up. Okay. I'm going to try to tell you what I learned in the past 10 minutes about languages. Or you want to sure. <laughs> Go for it. Um, 2,000, so all Spanish speakers in Milwaukee was 831. All other languages were 582. That's 2000. Um, and uh, let me see, there was another. And then there was another number, I think it's actually in the needs analysis. I'm looking through it right now. Um, so what I'll do is I'll find that and email it to the group. Because um, right now the census isn't breaking it down in other languages for me, but I think we got it from the housing needs analysis. We got a little bit more refinement might be the number that you guys are thinking of. And I almost have it. I almost have it. I'll have it in like five minutes after you all say goodbye. <laughs> okay. okay. To be continued then. Yes. I really appreciate that, everyone. Uh, if there are no other questions, I think we're done for the night. Great job, everyone. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see everybody. All right. Have a good nice to meet you all. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.